Now, uh, let me take a quick little poll, okay? A little poll. You ready? Let's get some interaction going here, okay? How many of you, I'm just curious, how many of you make your bed in the morning before you leave to go do your stuff? Just, okay? All right. How many of you clean the kitchen before you go to sleep because you don't want to wake up to a dirty kitchen, okay? How many of you clean up your workplace uh, at work before you leave, before you take off, okay? How many of you wait till later for stuff? <laughs> wait till later, a couple of you there. Well, that's just a quick little poll there, just to find out. You know, that's the, it, it, Cindy and I have discovered that it's not necessarily all the big decisions and the big challenges in life that make all the difference. It's all the little things that you decide through your day and through your life that make a big difference in your life. And what God is doing is is so important right now. Things are changing, okay? Uh, Things are happening in our country, and things are happening in the church. And it's really important that we're aware, that we're spiritually discerning it, and that our eyes are open, and that we're understanding what's happening around us. Okay, now... Uh, this is kind of my perspective on our country, all right? Now, uh, how many of you have uh, maybe some sons or daughters that are in their late teens, early 20s, okay? Now, here's my perspective. Our country, the United States of America, is in that stage, okay, where they're supposed to be grown up, but they don't know really exactly what to do. They're, they're, they feel like they're supposed to know everything, but they realize they don't know everything, and when they get in trouble, then they have to run back home for a bailout. And that's where our country is right now, okay, uh, maturity-wise. And we have to watch it as the church that we don't go with the culture, okay? Now, there's two kinds of people. Uh, there's people who are in need, and there's people who meet needs. That's two kinds of people. Now... The problem some of us are having in our culture today is we're in neutral. Okay, we're in between. We don't have a lot of needs, so we're okay. You know, paycheck to paycheck, everything's all right. We got the thing going on. But we haven't stepped into a position of responsibility yet to reach out and meet other people's needs. Now, God wants to do something for you so that he can do something through you. Okay, I'll give you a couple of examples. All right? Oral Roberts. How many of you have heard of Oral Roberts? He was a young man. He got tuberculosis. He was on his deathbed. God healed him. He had a healing ministry. He took healing to the nations all over the world, started a university, preached healing for years and years and years. Powerful man of God. What God did to him, God did through him. Okay? Brother Kenneth Hagin up in Tulsa, Oklahoma, uh, started Rama Bible uh, Training Center. Okay? (laughs) He was sick from the time he was born uh, all the way up to, you know, his uh, mid to late teens. I mean, he was sick. Uh, They thought he was dead at birth. His grandmother was holding him in the palm of her hand, and they thought he was dead. He weighed a pound. They thought he was dead. And she goes, no, there's still life in this little one. And she started feeding him with an eyedropper. And he was yellow. And, you know, you could see his veins through his skin trying to pump blood. Okay, now that wasn't a very good start. And all through his uh, childhood, he was sick. And uh, then, uh, I believe it was about 16 years old, 17, something like that, he started getting into the Word of God, and he got a hold of Mark chapter 11, verse 22 through 25, and started learning about faith. And he got a hold of this idea of faith, And he took hold of his healing by faith. Well, he had a faith ministry. He had a faith teaching ministry. And he could produce faith in people's lives like that. It was amazing. But what God did to him, God did through him. Now, if you're in neutral, God wants to do something to you. All right? So that he can do something through you. So the, God's bringing the body of Christ out of neutral. Our culture has been in neutral. It's like, don't bother me, I won't bother you, and everyone's minding their own business. Well, we're getting ready to get into some people's business. Because God is all about connection. God is all about relationship. God doesn't want to have something to do with you by remote control. 
Jesus was walking through the town one day, and there was a woman that had heard about his healing power, and she kept saying within herself, if I can just touch the hem of his garment, I'll be healed and made whole. She had been to every doctor. She'd spent all of her money. Nothing worked. She says, I'm going to do this. She pushed through the crowd, touched the hem of his garment. Immediately she was healed, but that wasn't good enough. Jesus stopped the crowd, and he said, who touched me? And Peter said, everybody's touching you. What are you talking about? Because <laughs> no, power went out of me. Someone got some, some of my power, and I want to meet him. I want to see him face to face. I want a connection with him. I don't want someone to just get a drive through blessing. Amen. Jesus is all about connection. Amen. And if Jesus is about connection, then we're about connection. And so God's getting ready to use us to connect with people, to get face-to-face -face with people, to go beneath the surface, to see them for who they really are, to see the value in them, uh, so that God can connect with them, we can connect with them, and we can be the family that God wants us to be. Yeah. Amen? So culturally, there's some things going on we need to shake out of our culture and not look so much like the world. Okay? Yeah. Because the culture's in trouble. Culture's got some problems, all right? And they're in that weird, you know, 18 to 25-year-old stage in our country where they don't really know where they're at, and they need some help. And we can rise up and help them, okay? So tonight I want to talk to you about marks of maturity. Uh, Cindy and I were in Austin, Texas last week, and we got to have dinner with a young man who used to go to our church. We started uh, in 1996. We started a church for teenagers. It was called Youth Wave Church. God spoke to me when we were in Australia doing some meetings. He says, I want you to go back. I want you to start a church for my young people. I want you to father my young people. I want you to show them who I am. And one of the young men that were in that church, I challenged him to become a campus pastor at Haltom High School right over here. Uh, he was, you know, he was skinny as a rail and had hair down to the middle of his back. Uh, and it was, I think he was in the band, you know. And uh, I just challenged him. I said, you need to be a campus pastor. And so we asked him last week. Now he's a lawyer in Austin. And uh, we asked him last week, we said, what did that do for you? What, being a campus pastor at a high school, what were the dynamics of that? How did that change your life as a student? And he said, well, really, a lot of it was taking the responsibility on myself of my school, of those people. I mean, they had, you know, 5, 10, 15 kids in their campus church. But they were reaching out to people. They were helping people. They were praying for people. He said, just, just for people to know that I would pray for them, that they could come to me and I would pray for them, it brought everything below the surface, you know, where everything else was, hi, how are you? Fine, fine, hi, fine, fine, you know, just surface. This brought it below the surface. I got to really know who people were and what was going on in their lives because they would trust me because they would ask me to pray for them. So it was a totally different dynamic. He took the responsibility of his school on himself. Now, this is what I see happening. Pastor Linda, you know, the induction, the draft, that's what's going on. That's what's happening here. And the price is going up. And in the early church, when the Holy Spirit fell, the price went up. Okay? The cost of following Jesus went up. And uh, it was a whole lot more serious than it had been. Now, I thank God for the pioneers of faith that had gone before and had paid the price for us to have these kind of freedoms, but we can't take these freedoms for granted. And God's wanting to break through even more to create some things. I mean, you know, there ought to be prayer in schools. There ought to be the Bible in schools. There ought to be, you know, the, we ought to have freedom of religion in our country where we say we have it, but they're trying to squeeze that thing off. So something's getting ready to happen, and it's happening. And the price is going up. So we need to rise up to maturity in the things of God. So we're going to look at several passages of Scripture here tonight and, uh, and talk about this a little bit. We'll see what the Holy Ghost wants to say. All right, go to 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and starting in verse 1. Everyone say, I love my Bible. <laughs> Praise God. The Word of God is powerful. Now we're going to look at this. We're going to look at marks of maturity. It's funny, I put it on Facebook today. Uh, this is what I'm going to preach on tonight. And a friend of mine, Juan Galloway, uh, who's up in New York, and he has a relief bus, and he takes it to the homeless in New York City, and they feed the homeless, and, and uh, they have a, a, 
a church there in, in downtown New York area, and they minister, and he wrote me on Facebook. He says, I think the marks of maturity are showing up on my face. <laughs> Those aren't the marks of maturity that I'm talking about here tonight, okay? We're not, not going to pass out skin cream or anything like that. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and starting in verse 1. 1 Corinthians 3 verse 1. He says, And I, brethren, could not speak to you as to spiritual people, but as to carnal, as to babes in Christ. I fed you with milk and not with solid food, for until now you were not able to receive it, and even now you are still not able, for you are still carnal. For where there are envy, strife, and divisions among you, are you not carnal and behaving like mere men? For when one says, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are you not carnal? Okay, now, what Paul's saying here is, I'm talking over your heads. Now, one of the most frustrating things for a pastor is the realization that they're talking over everybody's heads. Because really, the thing that thrills a pastor's heart is to connect with people. That they're talking, but it's not just noise, that there's a connection going on. I mean, it's happening. It's, it's clicking, and they're getting it, and we're going somewhere with this, and it's happening, okay? That's a pastor's heart. They want to connect, and they want you to get it, and they want you to come up. Now, here's, this is what he's talking about here. These are people in the church. These are people, you know, leaders. These, the, this letter was to the church. This letter wasn't to... Uh, you know, all the new people in the church, this was to the church. This was to the leaders. This was to the elders. This was to the pastors. And he's like, look, guys, we need to come up a little bit. Now, the Corinthian culture was bad. I mean, we think our culture is bad. You know, it's, it was more like, like New York City or Los Angeles or New Orleans was the culture of this Corinthian area that this church was in the middle of. I mean, it was Sin City. There were just sin everywhere, and it was rampant. And it was a high price for these people to stand up in the midst of that and be mature Christians. Now, carnal, you ever heard of chili con carne? What does that mean? Chili with meat. Carne means meat. Okay, anyone know Spanish? Okay, carne, what does that mean? Meat. It means meat. Okay, so these people were a bunch of meatheads. Okay? They were fleshly minded. They would think about the flesh, okay? And their responses were in the flesh. Now, let's do a contrast here because if one is true, then the other is true, all right? Uh, so the, the, we're going to look at the opposites here for just a second, okay? Uh, for Paul to not talk over their heads, they were going to have to lift up their heads. They are going to have to get their brain out of the flesh, and they are going to have to rise up to the spirit to gain that place of maturity that... God wanted him to be. Okay, number one, spiritual. God wants you to be spiritual versus carnal. He doesn't want you to be a meathead. He wants you to be a spirit man. Okay? That's what he wants. That's where we're going. That's us. Not neutral. Okay? We're coming up. All right. Number two, God wants you to be mature versus being a baby. Okay? Mature versus being a baby. Now, this is important. It's, you might be thinking this is elementary, but you know what? Paul was writing this to leaders. And every once in a while, we need to check on ourselves to see where we're at. Because it's not just how long we've been around. It's what we're doing that really makes all the difference in the world. Not just hearers, but doers. Amen? Okay. Number three, able to receive versus not able to receive. Okay? If you're sitting here tonight going, I've heard this before. I've heard this all before. You're not able to receive. Okay? If, if you're here tonight, you know, Gary, that was just an awesome job. I love those old songs, man. You're just pulling them out, and I was just jumping in them, you know? I just love that. True worshipers can worship anywhere, anytime, with anything. Okay? And, and if, if, if you're not able to receive the worship, then you need to make an adjustment. You need to tweak yourself a little bit and learn how to worship. And if you have a hard time with that, then you need to worship for 30 minutes before you come to church so that you're geared up and ready. Because if you're just watching, you know, TV for 30 minutes before you come, you're not going to be spiritually geared to be able to receive in worship. And Gary, what you said was so right. I mean, God's wanting to pour his spirit out in worship in ways we haven't even thought of yet. And if you're geared for it, you'll be able to receive it. 
okay? So able to receive versus not able to receive. That's a mark of spiritual maturity is you're able to receive. You can receive anywhere, anytime. You, you look and you can see God in something, okay? Blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God. In what? Wherever they're at, whatever they're doing, it's like they can, they, they can recognize what God's doing. Okay? Able to receive. Number four, believing in each other versus envy. All right? This is a mark of spiritual maturity, to be able to believe in each other versus envying each other. Now, here's, here's an easy way to remember envy. N-V. N-V. No vision. Without a vision, the people perish. If you have no, another translation says, without a vision, the people cast off restraint. They don't have any self-control, so they cast off restraint. Maturity, you have control. Immaturity, you say whatever comes to your mind. You know, if something hits you the wrong way, you open your mouth and say all the wrong things. That's immaturity. But if you have maturity, you know how to hold your tongue, okay? Now, envy isn't just... It's different from jealousy. Jealousy is, I want what they have. They have something nice, I want it. That's jealousy. Envy is, I don't want them to have it. I wish they were dead instead of having it. That's what the Pharisees did to Jesus. They didn't like it that he had authority. They didn't like it that he had influence. They didn't like it that everyone wanted to follow him around. They didn't just want to take that away from him. They wanted him dead. Okay, That's what envy does. All right. So, Believing in each other and loving one another instead of envying one another, that's a mark of maturity, is to be able to believe in each other and love each other that way. All right, number five, encouragement versus strife. Okay, instead of talking bad about each other, you talk good about each other. That's maturity. Okay, number six, unity versus division. I'm just breaking this down for you. All of this is in this verse that we just read, okay? It's all there. I'm just breaking it down. So we're, we're doing the chart. So you've got the gauge. So you can look at it and go, okay, where am I with this? Okay, I need to adjust that a little bit. All right? Unity versus division. Unity versus division. Being united. Being together. Now, I keep saying this, but this is a message I believe that God wants for this generation is God is about connection. God is about the church being vitally connected to each other. Not just doing their own thing but being vitally connected. The early church, if they had extra land, if they had extra homes, if they had extra stuff, they sold it, brought it to the church, laid it at the apostles' feet. Well, you know what? They did that willingly. Peter didn't tell them to do that. The Holy Spirit got in them and did it, all right? Now, if I got up here tonight and I said, okay, everyone sell everything and bring it here to the church, you know, your reaction to that would be somewhat of a gauge of where you're at. I'm not asking you to do that, all right? Thank God. Praise the Lord. Okay? But when the price goes up, you have to check your maturity level. And the price is going up. And God's going to require some things of his people in these last days. And it's going to be important that we're mature enough to step forward. He's wanting to do that. Unity is one of those things we need to, we need to uh, make sure that we're firmly grasped it. All right, number seven. Godly men versus worldly men. He says in this passage, mere men. He says, if you're, if you're thinking like this, then you're thinking like mere men. You are not mere human beings. You are God beings. You are a new creature in Christ. Old things are passed away. All things are become new. And you have God on the inside of you. Well, that's different. Now, another thing about this culture that really bothers me is uh, there's this real resistance to people not wanting to come across like they know everything, okay? There's a real resistance. Nobody's an expert. Everyone's just giving their opinion. Well, this is just my opinion. Well, you know what? If you're right, you're right, okay? And God's going to just give his people a dose of you're right. And to where you're going to be able to walk in a situation and say this is the way that it is, and they're not going to be able to say anything about it. Because God will give you a mouth and wisdom that the enemy can neither gainsay nor resist. God's going to give you words and God's going to give you favor. And you're going to be able to stand up with confidence and boldness. 
Now, that was one of the things in the early church because they had that generation, that culture had the same thing. The Pharisees had dumbed down the people so much that they weren't allowed to have an opinion. And when the apostles came and they had boldness, everybody was like, wow, this is new. This is fresh. This is exciting. That's the generation we live in again. Okay? So we're going to be godly men, not just mere men. Okay? Now, and number eight, we're going to be one in God versus being in cliques. He talks about this. He says, one of you says, I'm of Paul. One of you says, I'm of Paulo's. Oh, I, I do, I do this name dropping and all of this kind of stuff. No, we're supposed to be one in God. Amen. You know, if someone comes up and says, I'm Baptist, you should say, praise God, me too. I got baptized. Amen. Someone comes up and says, I'm Methodist. You, you say, me too. I love the methods of God. I'm just doing it all through here. Someone comes up and says, I'm Presbyterian. You say, me too. The governments of God are so awesome. That's what Presbytery means, is the government, the structure of God. Someone comes up and says, I'm Catholic. He said, me too. It's the universal church. That's what Catholic means. It's the universal church. And so, you know, we just need to all of a sudden be embracing, okay? Now, we don't embrace, you know, doctrines that will take you here and there and throw you all over. We'll talk about that in a minute. But, but we don't need to be clicky either. Someone says, oh, I'm, you know, I go to this. Year. Whoa, oh, oh. Stop that. That's immature. Okay, that is immature. He's saying it here. Don't be like that. That's being a meathead. All right, look at someone say, don't be a meathead. All right, now go over to Hebrews chapter 5. Hebrews chapter 5. Hallelujah. I'm teaching you tonight, okay? I'm teaching you some stuff. We're getting it. Hebrews chapter 5. And in Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 12, he says this, Hebrews 5, 12, For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God, and you have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But solid food belongs to those who are of full age, that is, those who by reason of use... Everyone say use. You've got to use this stuff. By reason of use, they have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Okay? Now, let me just touch on that for a second before I, I walk you through. I've just got a couple of points on this particular passage. But uh, when, my, when my children were little, uh, my sons now are 29 and 27 years old. And I've got grandkids. But when they were little... And they'd be watching TV. Uh, you know, TV will numb you down. Just numb you out. Just like, you know, things will happen on TV and you don't even react and respond. Well, we got into this gear that if something was on and something happened that was bad or evil or wrong or whatever, I would react to it and I would do it openly. Someone gets murdered. Someone gets treated wrongly. So, you know, whatever it was, if it was wrong, I would react to it. You know, it's just going along. It, mostly people don't respond to TV or movies or whatever. You just kind of sit there and watch, you know. But my kids, you know, it, whether it was a cartoon or a sitcom or whatever, you know, something would happen. I'd go, oh, my gosh, I can't believe they did that. Oh, what? And, and my kids are like, what, what, what? And it was my opportunity to train them, to get their senses exercised, to discern good from evil. Because the world pumps that stuff into people to where it's like, you know, nothing's wrong. Nothing's wrong. Nothing, you can do anything. Nothing's wrong. Nothing's evil. Nothing's bad. And the world pumps that into people. Okay? To the point, this, you know, one of my pet peeves is a lot of the Disney films. That's, maybe I'm stepping on your toes here. But a lot of the Disney films, Lion King, Little Mermaid, a uh, bunch of them. Uh, here's, the t here's the young person. They don't want what the father has. They want their own. So they're going to do their own thing, and they're going to go off their own way, and they're going to try a bunch of stuff, and they're going to have, you know, a crisis and all of this stuff. But in the end, they're going to get their own way, which tells all these children, you know better than your parents, and you should go off and try your own way. And while, in essence, you know, kids are going to grow up, and kids are going to go off, and kids are going to, you know, have a life, 
on their own, just the core of that, the principle of that, is so opposite of the kingdom. Okay? Because you know what? All the Father wants is to hang out with you. Okay? And, you know, you can even see that in these films that they're doing. This. The heart of the Father is He just wants His kids around. And all the kids want is not to be with the Father. And so what do we have in this generation? We've got a generation of people that think like that. And they're not connected with the Father. And the minute they leave home, they don't go to church anymore. And they're not connected to God. So anyway, that's one of my pet peeves. That's, that's free. That's just a side thing. Okay. Hebrews 5 and 12. Uh, let's look at the contrast here. Okay. Paul's saying, okay, you ought to be further along. You ought to be further along. He's talking to a group of people that they were in need, they got their needs met, and they stayed right there in neutral and didn't move up to the position of responsibility they were supposed to. They were neutralized. Okay? They weren't like Jesus. And that's what Christian means is Christ-like, anointed, Ready to go. And this is what God's getting ready to do in this generation is to release his anointing through his people like we've never seen before. I mean, little kids laying hands on people and seeing miracles and healings and, you know, in the workplace and in the schools and just the power of God just released. Amazing. All right. So here's the contrast. Number one, teachers versus students. You ought to be teachers by now. Not just perpetual students for the rest of your life. You ought to be teachers by now. Number two, solid food versus milk. You ought to know how to feed yourself by now. You ought to know how to study the word for yourself by now. You ought to know how to take the word and put it in your own mouth by now. You ought to learn how to stand with the word of God like a sword and fight the devil off yourself by now. That's what he's saying, teachers versus students, okay? And solid food versus milk. Number three, you ought to be discerning versus unskilled. Now, discernment, the gift of discernment is not the gift of suspicion, all right? It's not going around suspicious of everybody. Ooh, are you wrong? You know, that's not it. That is not the spirit he's talking about. But discerning, being able to tell the difference, you know, by the spirit. It's like, okay, that ain't the way to go. Just to, to have that knowing in your spirit. See, you, you, by use, you develop that, Okay? And when you do, like what I was talking about, when you're watching TV and there's, you know, I, we would change a channel. If something bad's happening, we'd change a channel. And, you know, uh, because a lot of TV shows, they start off pretty good. And then halfway through the season, they're not anymore. And they try to hook you in and then, you know, just change the whole thing. So you have to learn how to discern those things and then just shut it off, get away from it. Just, you know, I mean, TV is just one area, all right? There's lots of areas. So discerning is really important. And number four, full age and fully developed versus being a baby. Okay? I mean, it would be terrible if this group of adults, if someone had to feed you. You know? It'd be ridiculous. You know? I mean, I've got uh, three grandbabies uh, under the age of three, uh, under the age of two right now. And so, you know, They're everywhere. We had two of them at our house today. And, you know, as soon as they can, they want to feed themselves. And I think God's raising up a generation of Christians that is going to get hungry like that. It's like, no, 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 no. Get that spoon away from me. I mean, my grandkids, it's like, oh, no, you don't. You are not going to use that spoon on me. You know, they're just, no, I want to use my hands, and I want to get a hold of this for myself, and I want to feed myself. God's doing that with the body of Christ. It's like, no, I need the word. I need to get up early. I need to pray. I need to take hold of this thing myself and make it happen. And that's what's happening, okay? We're, not, we're getting out of neutral, and we're getting into gear here, all right? All right, one more passage. Now, these aren't, none of these are new verses that God just wrote, all right? These are verses we've heard before, all right? It's, really, until we get these verses down, we don't need any new ones. Amen? All right. Ephesians chapter 4. Go over to Ephesians chapter 4. And we've got a rundown of maturity here in this, in this passage that's just amazing. Okay? It's powerful. Ephesians chapter 4, starting in verse 11. This is so good. All right. 
It says, and he himself. Everyone say, he himself. Who's that talking about? It's talking about Jesus. He himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. For what? For the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Why? Till we all come to the unity of the faith and to the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting, but speaking the truth in love, we may grow up in all things into him who is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body joined and uh, knit together by whatever joint supplies, according to the effect of working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. Okay, now this is powerful. Now, it starts off with the fivefold ministry. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. Okay? These are your leaders. Our culture has said since the 60s, don't trust anyone in authority. Don't trust the government. Don't trust your parents. Don't trust your teachers at school because they don't know better. You know better, okay? You know better because you've watched those Disney films and I want to be where the people are. You know, it just, it's just all over the place and all around us, okay? So what have we done? We've gone with the culture and we don't trust our apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Now, First, you don't have to go there. First Timothy chapter 2 says, Pray for those in government, those in authority over you, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. I was doing that consistently, praying for our government, praying for our leaders. One day the Lord tapped me on the shoulder and he said, Okay, I want you to add something to that. I said, What? He says, I want you to pray for the government of God. I said, What do you mean? He says, Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers, they need your help. I said, Okay. He said, pray for them like you've been praying for your, the president and praying for the government and praying for the mayor. And, you know, pray for them. Pray for them. They need strength. They need help. They need backup. They need, they need to be able to do what I've called them to do, so get behind them and pray for them. So I started doing that and in, investing in that. And, it, you know, it, it's amazing the authority you can get when you pray for authorities. You, you just start walking in authority because... You're, you're part of that. You're connected to that through prayer. And it's an awesome thing. It's powerful. And in our churches, we need to connect with our pastors. We need to get behind them. If you get bent out of shape, then know this. It's the devil trying to cut you out away from the flock and get you off on your own so he can attack you and suck your blood. That's what he's wanting to do. If you're getting bent out of shape, it's the devil whispering in your ear saying, oh, that pastor, that, that, so all those leaders, oh, those elders, oh, those da-da-da-da-da. And he, he's lying to you to cut you out. Okay? So if you get a thought like that, you need to discern it, and you need to go straight to prayer, and you need to talk to God about it and say, God, here's what's going on. I don't quite understand it, but God, in Jesus' name, I know you're fixing it. I know our church is anointed. I, I, that is my church. That is my pastor. That is, those are my leaders. And in Jesus' name, we're breaking through. We're pulling through. We're pushing through. We're making this thing happen. This starts with the apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. They are placed in the body of Christ to help us do what we're supposed to do. Okay? They're not placed there to do it. They're placed there to help us do it. And we need to recognize that. Okay? So, let's go through this. Here's, here's what they're supposed to do. All right? We're supposed to connect and submit to leadership so that we can be, number one, equipped. If you're not connected, if your heart is not connected to your leadership, you can't be equipped. If your heart is connected to your leadership, you can be equipped. Okay? And I'm talking about your heart. God doesn't look at the outward. God looks at the heart. Okay? Just, just being in a room isn't being connected with your heart. you got to put your heart into it. All right. Number two, God wants you to connect with leadership so that you can be sanctified. Because he says that right here. Okay? He says, uh, till we all come to the, oh, wait, before that. For the equipping of the saints. What does that mean? For the saints. Does it mean St. Christopher? St. Nicholas? Who's, who's it talking about here? What does that mean, though? The sanctified ones. The set-apart ones. How many of you, uh, how many of you ladies have uh, a diamond ring? 
Okay? Do you just put that on the edge of the sink and just leave it there and just, yeah, if you want to lose it. You set that thing apart. You put that in a special place. Well, that's, that's who you are. God has set you apart and put you in a special place in the body of Christ. Okay? When you connect with the leadership that God has placed in your life, you become set apart and sanctified and cleansed and prepared for that good work. Okay? That was number two. Uh, when you connect to the leadership, number three, you become qualified. You can become qualified. This is really important in a generation where a lot of people are being disqualified. A lot of leaders are being disqualified. You know, they're trying to lead with problems and situations and issues and baggage, and it's not working. And maybe they don't have the leadership in their life that they need. And that shouldn't happen that way. But part of it is because we haven't really connected to the structures of leadership that God wants us to do. Okay, connecting to leadership, number four, will cause you to be built up. God wants you to be built up, not worn down, okay? If you're burned out, then you're not built up, okay? And there's a difference, and you know that there, there's a difference, okay? Uh, number five, you connect to the leadership, and you'll become united together. And that's important. Number six, you connect to the leadership and you'll be full of faith. Why? Because you won't be paying attention to a bunch of negative garbage. You're connected to the leadership. You're going that direction. You're, here we go. Okay? You're not bent out of shape. You're, you're with the program. You're united in faith and you're full of faith. Number seven, you're connected to the leadership. You will know God. How many of you had a, a good father figure growing up? Okay? You know, that's priceless to have that because it just really helps you to transition into the kingdom really easily. But if you didn't have that, you know, what do you do? Well, what did Abraham do? He didn't have that. He grew up in a heathen nation that worshiped idols, worshiped the moon. He had to get a hold of God himself, and you can do that. You can get a hold of God the Father yourself. Abraham did and became the father of nations, all right? So it'll help you know God. Number eight. It'll help you, be, connecting the leadership, help you be perfectly mature. Perfectly mature. Number nine, connecting to the leadership will bring you to full measure. The measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. How many of you want some full measure? You don't want this half full stuff. Is the glass half empty or half full? Neither. It's full. If you're hanging around with Christ, it's full. Number ten, full grown. God wants you full grown, okay? You remember junior high? Remember how awkward that was? Your legs were three-fourths of your entire body. You know? It's like, you got any money? I don't know. Let me check my wallet. It's just right there, you know? And how awkward you felt. It's like, you know, nothing's right, man. Nothing's shaped. Well, that's how a lot of people are spiritually. They've developed funny, you know? And, and they're not fully grown. Yet. All right. Number 11. Full of anointing. You connect to the leadership. You can be full of anointing. How many of you want to be full of anointing? Me too. Number 12. No longer pushed around. You connect to the leadership. You will no longer be pushed around. Why? Because you're connected. You know? <laughs> you ever think about that? A policeman with a whistle stands out in the middle of a road in front of a truck blows his whistle, and holds his hand up, okay? Unless he's Superman, he cannot physically stop that truck. But he has the entire United States of America behind him saying whatever that guy says goes. So he's got this authority with a whistle. And he blows that whistle, holds his hand up, and that truck better stop. Better do everything he can to stop, because otherwise he's going to jail, and whatever else, you know, they've got for them. So, anyway, okay, no longer pushed around. Number 13, no longer tricked. How many of you are tired of getting tricked by the devil? Amen. Me too. Number 14, no longer deceived. Same thing, no longer deceived. Number 15, now we're going into some of the, some of the uh, solid direction here. When you've connected to the leadership, you, have, you possess the ability all of a sudden to speak the truth in love. 
because your heart has been connected to the leadership that God has placed in your life. You have a vital connection to the anointing that God has placed in your life. You can open your mouth and you can release the truth in love. It's powerful. Number 16, you can grow up in all things. Everyone say all things. How many of you want to grow up financially? How many of you want to uh, grow up relationally with relationships in your life? Okay, important. All right. I know this is a lot, but there's a lot in this verse. Number 17, uh, uh, grow up in the anointing. We want to be good at the anointing. You know, I, I think about 100 years ago, there was Smith Wigglesworth, there was John G. Lake, there was E.W. Kenyon, there was Oswald Chambers, and they wrote all these amazing things and did all these amazing things, and 100 years later, where are we? I mean, come on, we should have gotten what they had by now, and we should have gone further. So we're still trying to catch up to where those guys were 100 years ago. And we need to grow in anointing. We need to walk in this that God has given us. Number 18, you connect to the leadership and you will be a part of the body. Instead of just, you know, severed and sitting over there by yourself drying up. You'll be a part of the body functioning and operating. Number 19, you will be truly connected. Isn't your heart tired of being lonely? How many of you want to be truly connected to what God's doing, what's happening in the body of Christ? Then we need to get with the program and connect. Amen. Number 20, if you connect with the leadership, then you can be doing your part. If you're not connected with leadership, you can't do your part. But if you're connected to the body and you're connected to that fivefold ministry, you're connected where God has placed you, then all of a sudden anointing will be available for you to be able to do it. Got four more. This is 21. If you're connected to the leadership, you can be truly effective. You won't be spinning your wheels anymore. You won't be trying to minister anymore. It will be truly effective. I think about in Acts chapter 6 when they said, let's choose seven men among us, full of the Holy Ghost, full of wisdom, to do what? To wait on tables. I mean, can you imagine if McDonald's started doing that as a qualification for working at their restaurants? You have to be full of the Holy Ghost and full of wisdom to serve fries. Why? Because they want the anointing right there at the cashiers, you know? Well, Stephen, he got a hold of this, man. He, he connected, and because he connected and he was faithful, the power of God was moving through him. And you know what? It, they, they took him and they persecuted him, and he went to heaven. But you know what? His death sparked another wave of revival that took that area. It was powerful, okay? God's still waiting for us to rise up to our place of function in the Holy Ghost so that he can move through us and flow through us and make things happen so we can be truly effective. Number 22, so we can do our share. You have something to do. We can do our share. Number 23, connect to the leadership so you can cause growth. Cause growth. Cause growth. Look at someone say, cause growth. Look at someone else say, cause growth. Pastor Linda just got back from Germany, and the, and the people were lining up around the building to get in the building to hear the word. Okay? Now, I, I told you this a couple of weeks ago when I preached. This building is going to become the training center, and we're going to have to rent out high school auditoriums and stadiums to be able to have the meetings in. Why? Because it's shifting. It's changing. The army of God is rising up to take a hold of this thing, and it's going to happen. And the people... The people of our culture are hungry, and they're disconnected, and they're lost, and they want what we have. Anyway, okay. Last one, 24. If we connect with the leadership, connect and submit to the leadership that God has placed in our lives, we'll be able to build up others. We'll be able to build up others. And that's what God's after anyways. Okay, now. I grew up in Grand Rapids, Michigan. My older brother, who's a year older than me, ended up going to a different high school than I did. The elementary school we were in joined a certain school district when I was in sixth grade before I went to junior high. So he ended up at one high school. I ended up at another. His high school had a revival during the Jesus People movement. Mine didn't during the time I was there. So he got saved. He got filled with the Holy Ghost. Uh, he was witnessing to me and sharing Jesus with me. But, you know, he was my brother. So I didn't trust him. 
okay? You know? It's like, you know, he's, you, you understand. Sibling, you know, stuff. Anyways. Yeah, I wasn't mature. I wasn't. I was a goofy teenager. I didn't know nothing, okay? Uh, the summer before my senior year, he took off and came down here to Dallas to go to Christ for the Nations Institute. And uh, so he, he had it on down. Well, right after he left, my mom got me alone and said, uh, I can't handle it anymore. Uh, I want a divorce from your father. And that began the worst year of my childhood. You know, just separation and trying to reconciliation and just back and forth. Anyways, my mom and dad were back together saying they were going to try and work it out during Christmas. My big brother came home for Christmas, and he gave me a living Bible for my birthday. And, uh, you know, with my name on it. It's awesome, you know. And uh, I wasn't in gear. I wasn't connected. I was just there. But, you know, we had Christmas. It was kind of normal, not really. Before he left to come back to Christ for the Nations, he sat me down. And he said, Spencer, I've done what I can do for this family. And he looked me in the eyes and he said, the spiritual responsibility of this family is on your shoulders. And I had no idea what that meant. Did not have a clue. But I started reading that Bible every night before I went to sleep. And one night I even didn't, you know, there was a dance at the school and I didn't go. I stayed home and read the whole book of Proverbs instead, and felt really wise for about a week. You know, I was like, wow. Uh, there was, uh, later on that year, there was a, a fast day, and I fasted. I didn't even know what I was doing. I wasn't even saved. And I fasted. Uh, some friends of my brothers, they were involved with the Jesus march that they were doing through the town, and I went and got a sign and marched with them. I didn't even know the Lord. I just thought, well, that sounds fun. You know, uh, God started working in my life and doing things in my life. But it was because he sat down with me and said, the spiritual responsibility of this family is on you. And I started praying for my family. I prayed every night before I went to sleep and uh, finished out my senior year in high school, came down to Dallas, Texas to visit my brother, got a job two days after I got here, uh, uh, and I was living on the campus and working. And my brother said, hey, why don't you think about going to school here? While you're here, you make some friends. I thought it was a good idea. So I went and got the application. I'm filling it out to Bible school. It says, describe in a page or less your conversion experience. I didn't know what that meant. So I went next door and I said, Steve, what does this mean? He goes, well, do you want to get saved? I said, sure. God had been working in my life. He prayed with me, and it felt like 100 pounds of sin and rejection and fear and insecurity just lifted off of me like that. It's awesome. Just came right off. Uh, I got the baptism of the Holy Spirit in Sister Pauline Parham's class. I don't know if you, do you know Sister Pauline? You know who she was? Uh, her father-in-law, Charles F. Parham, in Topeka, Kansas, at the turn of you know, over 100 years ago, 1900, the Holy Ghost fell in this place in Topeka, Kansas with a group of people that were studying the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And from there, William Seymour came to that, and then he went down to Houston, and then he went from there to Azusa Street. And the Holy Spirit went all over the world. Well, Charles F. Parham, this was his daughter-in-law, was my instructor in my Holy Spirit class at Christ for the Nations. And she's, she was about this tall, not taller than the podium, Pentecostal through and through. She said, today everyone's going to speak in tongues. Stand up. I stood up. She says, put up your hands. I put up my hands. She says, speak in tongues. I spoke in tongues. I didn't want to flunk. I mean, that was, this was my induction. This was my induction. Got involved in ministry, met my beautiful wife, Cindy. We've been married for 33 years, serving God. You know, just awesome. But it started with my brother pointing his finger at me and saying, the spiritual responsibility of this family is on your shoulders. And I, in putting this together to, today and just praying about this and, and just all this week, God's just been 
just impressing this on me. I, I feel like that's what God is saying to you tonight. The spiritual responsibility of this family, this generation, is on you. It's yours. You can own it, or you can stay in neutral if you want, but God's calling us to maturity. God's calling us. Maturity is taking the responsibility. Ed Cole said that, author of Maximized Manhood. Maturity is taking responsibility. So I want you to stand up. We're going to pray, and we're going to wrap this up with this. God, God's wanting to do in your heart what needs to be done for you to, to, you to step out of neutral and step into taking ownership of your generation. He wants you to own this, okay? Everyone God ever dealt with in this Bible came to this point. You know, Gideon, he's like, I'm nobody. How can you use me? You know, it's, and God helped him step by step to get to the place to walk in boldness, to walk in maturity, to take it, okay? Before we pray, I want to tell you a couple of things, okay? A lot of us have been praying for our own needs. We need to step up above that, and we need to, you know, how many of you would love for your house to be paid off? Would that be nice? I mean, wh- how would that change your financial picture if your house was paid off? And some of you are like, I'm in an apartment. What if you owned a house, free and clear? Would that change your financial picture quite a bit? Okay, then you need to start praying that God will pay off this house. Amen. Okay? And buy the lot next door. Why? Because if you rise up to that level, and seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, then all these things will be added unto you. Okay? And you know how God will do it? He'll use you. He'll pour it through you, and you'll be able to do it. How many of you would love to just write a check and buy this place? Would that be nice? Well, see, that's what, that's what maturity is. It's not just, oh, Lord, I need, oh, Lord, I need, oh, Lord, I need, oh, Lord, I need. It's like, Lord, we're going to take this town. We're taking this town. We are taking this town. And you rise up to a new level. And when you start praying up there, all of this other stuff gets taken care of. It's awesome. Lift up your hands. Father, in the name of Jesus right now, Father, we accept responsibility. Father, we take our place of maturity. We take our place of of functioning in the body of Christ. Father, in the name of Jesus, no longer will we stay in neutral. No longer will we stay back here where nothing's happening, nothing's going on, no anointing is flowing. Father, we're moving into a new place of anointing, a new place of release, a new place of financial uh, influence in our generation, a new place, Father, of changing things around us. Father, a new place of prophetic anointing where the prophetic is going to move and flow through us at work and at school and wherever we are. Father, even with our kids. Father, in Jesus' name, there's a new place that you have for us. There's things you want to do for us. So, Father, we rise up. We declare in the name of Jesus that this building is paid off. It is paid for. It is paid off. It is paid in full in the name of Jesus. And the lot next door is ours, too. And whatever other land around here, God, that's supposed to be ours, we take that, too. And, Father, in the name of Jesus, we're not going to let the leadership here carry that by themselves. We rise up and carry it, too, in the name of Jesus. We shoulder our load in the name of Jesus. We do our part in the name of Jesus. And, Father, Father, I thank you that it's happening. It's being done. Father, we are fully equipped. We are qualified. We are sanctified. We are set apart. We are yours. We belong to you, and we own it in the name of Jesus. Spencer and Cindy Nordyke, Reaching Nations and Generations. For more information, visit nordykeministries.com.